Welcome to Fireside Giants. My name is Zach with my co-host here, Anthony Rafardo. We're officially seven days away from the 2021 NFL Draft. I'm so freaking excited for this process to end. It was fun in the beginning, in the middle, to do all these mock drafts and simulations and talk about the rumors. But now I'm like, can we just finally get that already? I want to know who the Giants are going to get. I want to know what elite prospect hopefully they land. Especially with the 11th overall pick becoming such an advantageous spot lately um, with all of the rumors going around that teams are moving around this way, that way. I think the Giants are in a phenomenal position right now to get a great player, maybe even Jalen Waddle, Devonta Smith, whatnot. There's so much great talent on the board. But today we're going to talk about a tradeback scenario that Anthony put together last night. I'm really excited to see what this tradeback scenario is composed of and how they can really gain some quality players. Before we dive into this, Anthony, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing real good, and this is a trade back scenario that I put together after Ian Rappaport reported um, trading back is, quote, already something they are internally considering, end quote. That's what he said about the New York Giants. He also said that the 11th overall pick, quote, has real value, end quote. And then, so when you think about that, and I know Daniel Jeremiah kind of contradicted that today. He said, you'll see a right turn um, in NASCAR before you say Dave Gellman trade down. Yeah, but I don't think Dave Gettleman's fully running the show. Alex and I talk about that all the time. I think Joe Judge has a lot of say in this. And if Joe Judge feels like the Giants should trade down, I think there's a pretty good chance that it happened. Um, it almost happened last year. Remember, number four overall pick, they tried to trade down. They found no buyers, but they did really try to do it. And then in round two, they actually had a deal in place with the Chicago Bears. But they saw Xavier McKinney sitting on the board, said, okay, we're going to cancel this trade and just take this guy who has all pro potential, right? But with this mock draft or mock trade scenario, here's the mock trade, and it comes from a realistic, you know, report from uh, Dan Dugan of the Athletic. He um, looked at recent trades in the first round, recent trade downs, and he put together like a realistic compensation package based on real life trades that have happened. So using that, I made this mock trade. The Giants trade down to 15 overall with the New England Patriots. The Patriots get the 11th overall pick. While the Giants get 15th overall, a third round pick, which is 96 overall, and a fourth round pick, which is 139 overall. So I think that's a pretty nice trade package. You're moving down four spots, but you're gaining a third and a fourth round pick. Um, you're getting an additional pick within the top 100, which has real value. Um, and I think that this is a really nice trade package for the Giants, considering they're just moving down four spots while New England is, you know, moving up, presumably to get like Mac Jones or somebody who falls to 11. But I, I really like this mock trade. Um, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are, Alex. Well, speaking of pass rushers, you know, we've talked about the pass rushers over and over and over again and how they can fit. Jalen Phillips is one of the most intriguing ones that should be considered, and some have him as a top 10 pass rusher in any other draft class. Um, but even this draft class is, is, you could say he's there. It's the off the field stuff that kind of, that's kind of concern. The concussion history, the, you know, he was in a moped accident, he broke his wrist and had a concussion in that too. He might be one concussion, two concussions away from his football career ending when, at any given moment. That's the big concern when it comes to Jalen Phillips, but he is capable of being a 10 plus sack, double digit sack performer um, on a yearly basis. And I think that's why teams are looking at him saying, is this worth the risk? You know, if we trade back and the Giants, there's conflicting reports. You know, Daniel Jeremiah said today that there's a better chance of a NASCAR taking a right turn than Dave Gettleman dra uh, trading back an NFL draft, which is in normal in a normal circumstance, I would say yes, that makes complete sense because Dave Gettleman has been involved in eight uh, drafts as a general manager and he's never traded back in any of them. But with the emergence of Joe Judge, with the new coaching staff, some new front office personnel, I think they're becoming a little bit more modernized in their approach. They don't have to stay put if they don't want to. If a team looks at this at 11th pick and Mac Jones or Trey Lance is on the board, and they're like, I want to move up. The Patriots at 15 are like, we want our guy. We don't want to We don't want to risk the chance of you know Washington moving up and getting somebody or whoever it might be. We're just going to go up to 11, and we're going to make this deal happen, and we're going to get our quarterback. That's that's ultimately how it usually goes when there's a quarterback on the board and a team's not sure if he'll make it there, and they, and they think that the value is too good to pass up. You go and get your quarterback because if you have that – 10-year, decade-long guy like a Tom Brady or a Eli or a Peyton, you know, you are set for a very long time. I'm not saying that Mac Jones or Trey – or Mac – yeah, Mac Jones or Trey Lance will be that guy. But if a team sees them as potentially being that guy, then it's worth taking the chance on. So with Dave Gettleman, I don't believe he will trade down because it's historically not in his cards. But with Joe Judge here, I'm going to say it's a little bit more likely because he's kind of a wild card at this point. I'm not sure what, what he's going to do here. But the Giants have that opportunity to take a couple of elite prospects – and 
if you're at 11 and they take best player available, I can guarantee you that there's not a single pass rusher that is considered best player available at 11. But in this trade act scenario, you get Jalen Phillips, who I think is an absolute beast. He can be that a guy that plays multiple different alignments on the, on the defensive front. He can play in the three. Um, if you wanted him to, you could play five tech and outside linebacker. I think he has the ability to be very diverse, which is what Patrick Graham loves for a defense. So that gets me really excited about him. The injuries scare me. I tell Anthony, I tell you guys all the time, Players that are historically injury scare the crap out of me because those those issues don't usually dissipate overnight. If you're historically injured, you're probably going to get injured again. Um, you know, you're just predisposed. Maybe something about what you're doing or you know just bad luck, whatever it might be. And uh, the fact that he's been injured so many times is scary. But again, you can make the argument like Sterling Shepard might be one concussion away from having his football career over, and they don't seem to be worried about it. So Jalen Phillips, you know, maybe they're not worried about it that much. Um, you don't often see. I guess, defensive linemen get concussions that often. But again, maybe they're undiagnosed. They could just be minor things. You're getting literally smacked in the head by 300-pound offensive linemen. You know, they might just be building up over time. Um, you know, when you're tackling guys, leading with your head, you might just be getting, like, just constant minor concussions, which add up to a bigger one. Um, that's kind of what football is like. That's why, you know, CTE is a thing, because they're just minor concussions over a long period of time that build up into something more serious. So that's my concern with Jalen Phillips. But otherwise... The guy's an awesome football player. The Giants would be lucky to have him, and I think he would completely transform this defense um, or rather just add that necessary pass rush that they're lacking right now. Yeah, with Jalen Phillips at 15, um, of course there is a discussion about his injury history, and you mentioned um, Sterling Shepard's injury history, how you know he's potentially one concussion away from retiring and how the Giants don't seem too worried about that. Well, I do address that later on in this mock draft because I am worried about that. And I think that the Giants need more wide receiver depth. But I think at number 15 overall, the value is really good. The Giants clearly want to draft an edge rusher. They've been doing extensive research on all of the edge rushers. There's some analysts and scouts and people who have inside info saying Jalen Phillips actually could go in the top 10. I saw that report yesterday. Some are saying that the Giants are really strongly considering taking Jalen Phillips with the 11th overall pick. It seems like the Giants are down to three pass rushers that they really want. Quiddy Pay, Aziz Ojolari, and Jalen Phillips. Those are the three that they're looking at in the first round. Will they take one of them at 11? It's very likely because Dave Gettleman's history of trading down doesn't exist. So it's possible to just stick and pick and pick for need and take one of those three guys. But if you want to get one of these guys at good value, you're going to want to trade down because you know that they're going to be on the board at 15. So I went with Jalen Phillips just because... And like you mentioned, he is a top 10 talent. He's just got a terrible injury history. And I think that it sounds like he's pretty high on the Giants board right now. But realistically, with this 15th overall pick, more just look at the position. I think that they trade down a few spots and they get the edge that they want. So they can get Jalen Phillips or Aziz Ojolari. I'm a big fan of Aziz Ojolari. He's my edge number one in the class because he has no red flags. And I think he's very talented. Quiddy Pay is also really good, though. Very good run defending edge rusher. And I think that he would make sense for the Giants in a certain scenario as well. So, yeah, Jalen Phillips at 15 is the pick that I went with. But... Really just any edge, I think that it's very likely come next week. If the Giants do trade down, I absolutely think they're trading down to take an edge rusher at a greater value than they would have at 11. And I think that Jalen Phillips might be the greatest value at 15 possible if they're trading down for an edge rusher as long as he could stay healthy throughout his career. Yep. Ah, man. It's hard to say, like, you know, from when you talk to people, they kind of make it it clear that when you're building a defense, you need to build around – a premier edge rusher. You know, you you start there and then you work outside of that because when you have someone who can get to the passer very adequately, very, very efficiently and productive um, over a larger sample size, it changes how your scheme works, you know? The Giants played a lot of zone last year. They used a lot of extra blitzers where there was a linebacker or safeties. If you have that premier pass rusher, it allows you to lock down the secondary. You don't have to blitz as many guys because you can have that one guy who just takes over double teams, you know, completely dominates. Jalen Phillips next to Leonard Williams would be unfair um, for all intents and purposes. I think it would be one of the one of the best tandems in the NFL if Jalen Phillips, you know, was to remain healthy and really uh, translated well to the NFL level. He's a big guy. Um, I love the selection in this in this uh, mock draft because you're trading back and adding more value. But your second round pick, your first one. Right along, right along the lines of what I hate, another injured player, <laughs> Landon Dickerson on the interior. Um, I like Landon Dickerson. He's probably, when healthy, one of the best offensive linemen in this class, especially on the interior. He might be the best interior lineman in this draft class, um, you know, purely, you know, because we have, you have Rashawn Slater, who's projected to move inside, um, that's potentially projected to move inside. You have Elijah Vera Tucker, who could move inside. You know, the, all these guys are projected um, as guards, potentially, at the NFL level, but... Landon Dickerson is an interior lineman. 
You know, he played center for Alabama. The guy's an absolute stud when he's on the field. And he's a really great guy to have around. He's a great presence. But the injury history, you know, the guys had injuries almost every single year, torn ACLs, uh, knee injuries, ankle injuries. Those scare the crap out of me. You know, but if you're willing to take a chance on arguably the best interior lineman in this draft, it's worth it. You know, maybe it's worth it's worth taking the shot on it, um, Anthony. You know, what do you think about Landon Dickerson, and why do you think this is such a great pick for the Giants? You know, aside from the injury history, I'm not even saying that I think it's a great pick um, because I am very skeptical of Landon Dickerson as well. While I think he might be the best interior offensive lineman on the board, the reason I chose Landon Dickerson for this mock draft, it's not what I would have done. I wouldn't have gone Landon Dickerson because I think the injury history is really scary. But I think that the Giants are really high on Landon Dickerson, okay? I think that they went over to Alabama to the pro day, and I think that they kept a close eye on him, knowing that they have connections to Nick Saban, right? They like to draft these SEC offensive linemen, Andrew Thomas as well. So maybe at this pick, you could say it's Ben Cleveland out of um, Georgia, you know? Thomas's uh, former teammate, you could put him right there at left guard or put him right next to Andrew Thomas. But I think that the Giants' connection with Alabama is why I went with this pick, with Landon Dickerson, because... According to Paul Schwartz of the NY Post, it, quote, will be a surprise if the Giants do not take an offensive lineman with one of their first three picks, end quote, because of their lack of depth on the interior and the influx of depth in this draft class at interior offensive linemen. There's so much talent. So, again, like I said with Jalen Phillips, if you're going away from the injuries, you can go with Aziz Ojalari there. If you're going away from injuries here, you can go with any other one of the interior offensive linemen. You can go with a Quinn Miners, a Creed Humphrey, a Wyatt Davis. Mainly just saying edge round one, interior offensive lineman round two. That's the way that the draft boards are shaping out right now, and that's what will make the most sense for the Giants. But also, you got to keep in mind, Landon Dickerson is a phenomenal run blocker. The Giants love good run blocking interior offensive linemen. He had the highest run blocking grade in the SEC last season, according to Pro Football Focus, at 92.8. He logged snaps at every single position on the offensive line during his time in Alabama, though he was listed as a center. But he did play over 200 snaps at right guard in 2019, and a lot of people think that he can transition back to offensive guard once he gets to the NFL. So I think he makes a lot of sense for the Giants because of his versatility, which we know that the Giants value a lot, and his connections to Alabama, which Joe Judge obviously has many connections over there. So I think you play that connection game, and you say Landon Dickerson, oh, and the fact that he's from New Jersey and grew up a Giants fan, I think that's another thing to keep in mind. All these connections... Plus, he's a really good run-blocking interior offensive lineman. I think he makes a lot of sense for the Giants around two. But if you're too skeptical of the injury history, there's quite a few other names to point out there. Quinn Miners, Creed Humphrey, and Wyatt Davis would all be phenomenal picks um, with the second-round pick as well. Yeah, you know, when you talk about offensive linemen, I, I'm not entirely convinced that the Giants are going to go with a player who projects more as a center because I think they feel good about Nick Gates at center. I think they want a bona fide guard. You know, I think Landon Dickerson, you know, he's primarily a center, but he can make the transition to guard. Um, Quinn Miners is being projected as a starting you know, pro level guard, or uh, center rather. I think that they want a guy who has guard experience already, someone that they can plug and play day one. I don't think that they're necessarily in the boat of like, we want to develop somebody within like the next three months to play guard for us and start day one. I think they want somebody who knows the fundamentals, has experience there, like a Wyatt Davis. Um, I'm not entirely sure that they want to go with a guy they need to develop right now and, and then wait and see what happens. I think they want to plug and play it on uh, day two of the draft if they don't get a Rashawn Slater on day one, even though you know he's never played guard before either. So, I mean, he's just a kind of a different type of prospect, more of an elite level prospect rather than an upside one. But I think for the most part, this draft class is packed full of second round interior guards and, and centers rather than day one guards and centers. You know, they're, they're really packed in the day two category and they all have starting capabilities on day one. So I like that about, about this grouping. I like Landon Dickerson as a player. I think he's a phenomenal, uh, he's a big body guy. You know, he can, he can open up lanes in the running game. He's athletic. Like I saw the guy doing freaking cartwheels a couple weeks ago. Um, he's a big boy um, and he's fun. You know, he's a good guy to have in the locker room. And I think he'd pair well with, with what we have now. So that's that's exciting. I think that's a good pick there. The injury history scares the crap out of me, as I said before. But, you know, sometimes you've got to take a chance if you want to if you want to get the most upside out of a player. But with your third round selection here, but really interesting, you go with a cornerback. And, you know, I probably would go with a receiver in round three. I think this depth, the, the class is so deep. I know you go with one a little bit later on. We'll talk about him. I think personally I would have gone with a receiver because it's such a deep class. You, you can get some really great talent in round three. After that, it starts to drop off, I think. But this is also a good selection. Benjamin St. Just, I guess you would pronounce that, at Minnesota. He's a former Canadian high school 
uh, cornerback, made the transition to, uh, you know, American football, um, really, and, and you know, now he's playing with, you know, Minnesota, and he's coming to the NFL, and that's that's a, a round 376 overall pick. He's a player with immense upside. Um, you know, they project him as a really a heavy press man coverage corner, even a cover three type of guy. I think that, you know, as Anthony mentions in his article, which you go just go check out, we'll link it in the description, he he really has the ability to play perfectly in our scheme because I think the Giants are going to be playing a lot more man coverage this upcoming year than in the future. You know, signing a Dory Jackson and having James Bradbury already, Johnny Holmes, they are able to play press man coverage um, or off ball coverage. They can do both, either or. And I think that's going to really allow the Giants to get creative with their blitzing. It's going to allow them to use cover one, cover zero, and, and really trust their corners, trust their defensive backs to get the job done in the secondary and get after the quarterback, create turnovers that way. Um, so I'm excited to see what they do there. But why do you like Benjamin St. Juice here out of 76? I think St. Juice, the way that the board fell, I know receiver would have been a really valuable option. But the way that the board was falling, I wasn't crazy about any of the receivers that were on the board at 76. So I was just like, you know what, Benjamin St. Juice, six foot three cornerback, you know, out of Minnesota, very physical, likes to play in press coverage, cover three man scheme. Um, and I think all those things combined... Benjamin St. Juice is like a pretty solid player for the Giants scheme, and he provided good value there. And you know what? You can never have enough depth at cornerback. So this is a guy who might not start right away. You know, you have a Dory Jackson on the outside. Just sign him to a big contract. And you basically have two CB1s with James Bradbury and a Dory Jackson on the outside as a Giants for the Giants right now. But behind them, there's not like the best amount of depth. You know, I would prefer if they were to have Benjamin St. Juice as a depth piece that they can develop eventually into a starting caliber player. Because I think he has the tools, but I just think he needs some more refining, more development. And I think that him being a depth piece right here behind the Dory Jackson would be pretty solid. Giants fans should know more than anybody how important it is to have depth in the secondary. We've seen what injuries in the secondary can do to a team. Just think back to the Cleveland Browns game in 2020. Um, when uh, James Bradbury had COVID and, you know, there was all missing pieces in the secondary. I think Darnay Holmes was injured as well. Baker Mayfield was tearing us to shreds. He was lighting us up. He was eating our secondary alive. So I think it's very important for the Giants to have as much depth in the secondary as possible. And I think that Benjamin St. Juice provides really quality depth for the Giants in round three. But of course, I do agree, you know, you could absolutely go with a wide receiver in that scenario or address a different position of need. Cornerback might not be the biggest position of need there, but I just think filling in the depth, it was really solid value, and I like St. Juice a lot as a prospect. Yeah, I mean, look, if you're going to go man, man heavy in a man coverage scheme, which I think the Giants are going to transfer to uh, this upcoming season, because they really had to play a lot more zone based on their CB2 woes uh, with, uh, you know, the rotation of Ryan Lewis, Corey Valentine, and Isaac Yadam. But I will say this. I don't necessarily think they feel bad about their current depth at the position. I think they are like, okay, we have James Bradbury and Dory Jackson. Now behind him, you have Julian Love, who I think is very capable of being a, a solid, at least an average level corner um, to supplement you know, any losses or injuries. Then you have Sam Beal coming back, who could absolutely be cut. But I, don't, I think Dave Gettleman's pride will, will probably keep him around for one more season just to see what he can do. Um, and then you have Isaac Yadam. I think that's enough. I mean, Anthony, you're, you know, you're a, a big com proponent of Isaac Yadam, what he has to offer. So I think you know, as a depth piece, they're pretty set. They have three reserve cornerbacks there um, just in case. So I think they feel good about that, about that position, which is why I think I would rather go with a receiver at, in uh, 76. Um, but at the end of the day, you can never have too many good secondary pieces. You can never have too many developmental guys that you can grow over a period of time. And hopefully they turn into something more, especially with James Bradbury maybe moving on after his contract. So we'll see how that goes. But take us to, the, to, take us to your fourth round pick here. All right, looking at the fourth round pick, this one's really interesting. I like, um, I like to go interior defensive line here for the Giants. Now, I went with Tyler Shelvin out of LSU. Um, you could also say our guy, Aleem McNeil, Aleem the Dream McNeil. He could be your pick here if he makes it all the way down to 96. But I've seen him go as high as top 60, and I've seen him go as low as top 120. So I didn't really know where to project him. But Tyler Shelvin's pretty consistently being mocked around the top 100, around 96. So I thought that made a lot of sense. Plus, the Giants have shown interest in Tyler Shelvin already. At his press conference during his pro day, Usain Koshal reported that Tyler Shelvin, in fact, did speak with the Giants. He had an interview with them. They've had some 
interest there. Now, the reason I go interior defensive line here is because Tyler Shelvin is a really good nose tackle, an amazing run defending nose tackle. The Giants just lost their run defending nose tackle in free agency, right? Dalvin Tomlinson left, went over to the Minnesota Vikings. I think that we've still got pretty quality depth at defensive tackle right now, and I do like Austin Johnson, but I think that interior defensive lineman in the fourth round is a really solid way to go. I think that finding that Dalvin Tomlinson replacement with a guy like Tyler Shelvin potentially could be really, really good value for the Giants with the 96 pick. Because Tyler Shelvin, I do think, is a quality starter in the NFL. Like, he is that good of a run defender, and he's got really good leverage, really sinks his hips, bends his knees really well, and creates leverage on centers. And he really just plugs up running lanes. And I think that this is a guy who could really benefit from playing alongside guys like Leonard Williams and Dexter Lawrence, you know, where everyone's just plugging gaps. And then Tyler Shelvin just being a big body in the middle, plugging gaps and playing the run. Now, he's not much of a pass rusher at all, but he's a really good run defending nose tackle. And if you want to go Aleem McNeil here, I don't know if the Giants have shown any interest in Aleem McNeil, and I don't know if he would be on the board here. But if he is, of course, I'm going to take him because he's got the pass rushing upside. But I think that Tyler Shelvin as a run defending zero tech nose tackle is a perfect fit for the Giants here at the 96 pick. Plus, they have shown interest in him already. Look, when I'm looking at a nose tackle, especially like Tyler Shelvin, you know, a, a big guy, 6'3", 6, 6, 362 pounds. My number one goal for them is to, well, there's two two goals. One of them is to plug the A-gaps very efficiently. And two is to just soak up as much double teams as possible. You know, that's what I want these guys, these big boys in the middle of the, of the defensive front to do. I just want them to soak up double teams. Because if you can take a guard and the center away from a play, you can stunt the hell out of the out of the outside, or you can just 1v1 them on the tackles. You know, you have a guy like Jalen Phillips, and you have a guy like Tyler Shelvin. You're soaking up those guards and centers. It's a 1v1 as an outside linebacker for Michael uh, for Jalen Phillips, rather, to just, to just beat them. It's a 1v1. That's what I want. Mismatches, you know, combinations. Like, I want... This is what I want from those interior guys. I think Tyler Shelvin has that ability. He's a five-star recruit back in 2017. He's an early run down run defender. He's going to soak up those big A-gaps. He's going to really make it hard to run inside zone. He's going to force teams to run outside zone in sweep plays. And I think that's where the Giants struggled last year. A lot of teams realized their edge defenders were just so bad because they had injuries. Lorenzo Carter and Ocean Eximenes. They had so many problems on the edge that they were looking at guys like Cam Brown, Carter Coughlin, Jabal Shared to seal the edge at outside linebacker. And they just couldn't get it done because they just didn't have the experience or they were too old or whatever it might be not strong enough and I think that's kind of where the Giants need to make this upgrade now um and they need those guys like Jalen Phillips who can who can seal the edge and like if they do run inside zone Tyler Shelvin can sniff those out he can make sure that those a gaps are plugged especially with Leonard Williams like Dexter Lawrence can also helping on the b and c gaps and then if you're running outside sweeps you have the edge defenders to seal the edge and stop those sweep plays on the outside and I think that's where the Giants got beat last year and they recognize that so I think for the most part you did a good job of of Plugging a couple a couple big uh, problems here. One of them is you know making sure you get you replace um, Dalvin Tomlinson with a high upside player because I do think you know Danny Shelton I like him a lot and I do like um, Austin Johnson. Do I trust them? Not really. You know like Danny Shelton's had his injury histories. Austin Johnson's never been really a, a pro prominent starter. Um, if you know I think having a good guy with some upside from an LSU type organization is a, is a really great uh addition here especially in the mid to late rounds so i i can't say i don't like this uh this pick here yeah absolutely i agree i just think you know finding that replacement for dalvin tomlinson is super important but then with the the final pick of this mock draft that we got in this trade from new england um we got pick 139 now this is where i address wide receiver and i go with a guy jalen darden now i know a lot of people are really high on jalen darden a lot of people have him as a second round talent He's projected to go in the fourth, fifth round. Like he's projected to be a late round pick, um, but he really shouldn't be. Jalen Darden is phenomenal. He's really talented. Um, according to Pro Football Focus, Darden had the highest missed tackle rate per touch in 2020 amongst wide receivers at 31%, which was even higher than Kadarius Tony, who was only at 30%. So, and you guys know how much I like Kadarius Tony and everything that Kadarius Tony provides when he's got the ball in his hands after the catch. Now, Jalen Darden might provide even more with the ball in his hands after the catch. He's that good and that much of a weapon once he's running with the football in his hands. And he's also an amazing slot receiver. He gets it done out of the slot. He recorded 16 touchdowns out of the slot in 2020, which was the most in college football. And he also put together 935 receiving yards out of the slot, which was the second most in college football in 2020. So, yeah, Sterling Shepard is set to be our slot receiver this year, but looking down the road, his contract expires, I think, in two years, 
Um, he's also got the concussion history. So finding a slot wide receiver in the late, middle, late rounds, I think is ideal for the Giants. They got to get a slot guy, not another outside guy. I think we're good there because now we have Kenny Galladay um, and we have uh, Darius Slayton on the outside as well. I think the Giants are actually pretty solid with their outside wide receivers right now. I think they can feel comfortable there. But going forward, that slot position, because also keep this in mind. Sterling Shepard has not played the slot in a couple of years. He hasn't played the slot since 2017, I think. 2018, 2019, 2020, he was playing outside wide receiver. Um, so you got to keep that in mind. He's transitioning back to the slot. The Giants slot receiver previously was Golden Tate. He was cut. So the Giants technically, their 2020 starting slot receiver is not on the team. They're going to move Shepard back inside. That's what we assume. But it wouldn't hurt to have some depth there and and potentially get a guy that you can develop into a long-term starter in the slot. So I think that Jalen Darden out of North Texas at pick 139 would be an absolute dream um, for the Giants and be a perfect selection with everything that he can do out of the slot and everything that he can do with the ball in his hands, which the Giants really don't have in any of their wide receivers right now, a guy that can get the ball and just go and make people miss. I think Jalen Darden, especially being this late-round pick, you can probably make him your punt returner or kick returner, have him contribute on special teams. This would be a huge, like, great selection for the Giants at 139, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, Jalen Darden, when when you're looking at, you know, think about what Dave Gettleman said um, in a press conference on, on Tuesday afternoon. You know, he said, we want touchdown makers. Jalen Darden is kind of a touchdown maker. The guy has really, really good downfield ability. He can, you know, open up that field with his speed, uh, the deeper portions. But like you said, he's also a really great slot receiver. And he, he, I love this quote. He, he, had a, he had a really good quote last year. He said, making someone miss is like waking up in the morning and brushing my teeth. I got to do it every single day. I love that from Jalen Darden. And, you know, he's small. He's five foot nine, one seventy pounds. He's, you know, a smaller guy. He might get take a couple big hits and it might rattle him a little bit. But he makes guys miss in the open field. If you can get him into space, um, he reminds me a little bit of Tavon Austin just because he's smaller, quicker, faster. Um, and I think he'd be a really great guy to have as like a multi-purpose type of type of player. He can also return kicks and punts um, as well as become, you know, a, a decent slot or slot receiver at the NFL level. Um, I, I, I think he's a, a really agile, a quick player. And what I like about him the most is that he's a playmaker. You know, the Giants need playmakers. We don't need one-trick ponies. We don't need a guy who can only run vertical routes. We need a guy who can run vertical routes and short routes, intermediate routes, and do it at a good level. I just think that with Jalen Darden, he's a guy who's not going to be able to take those licks over and over and over again in the NFL level. You're going to have to get him into space. You're going to have to use him on screens. You're going to have to get creative with him, pre-snap motion, drag him across the line of scrimmage, do some exciting things with him and get him into space. But it's a really good fourth-round pick. Um, you know, as Anthony said, people have been talking him up for a couple of weeks now. And as a featured player, I think he has some potential at the NFL level. It'd be interesting to see what he can offer. Uh, definitely a little late to go receiver in this draft class, but that, that just tells you when a player like this is on the board in the fourth round, it's pretty damn crazy how deep this class really is. Yeah, absolutely. This class is deep at a lot of positions of need for the Giants. It's deep at corner. It's deep at receiver. It's deep at interior offensive linemen. Um, and I think that the Giants can really take advantage of that. They don't have to force their hand and force themselves to take a wide receiver if it's not good value. You know, like in round three, um, they didn't have to reach on a guy. They could address a different position in need and then just circle back to wide receiver later on because there's so many talented receivers in this draft class. And I think that Jalen Darden at that selection is a steal because this is a guy I think absolutely will be a starting caliber player in the NFL. At least that's how I feel. And I think a lot of people feel the same way. So Jalen Darden at that pick, I think is a home run. But overall, just to recap, I think that this was a pretty solid mock draft, um, four round mock draft. You know, the Giants gained an extra pick in the top 100 and then an extra fourth round pick in this trade. If the Giants were to do this, if they were to trade down from 11 and go just to 15, only four spots back, I think that you're getting a lot of value as a New York Giants. You're getting an extra third. You're getting an extra fourth round pick. Those two picks are huge because the Giants are tied for having the second least um, amount of draft picks going into this draft with only six. They only have six picks. There's seven rounds and they only have six picks. Now you're getting up to eight picks by making this trade, and I think that's really valuable for the Giants. The more the merrier. The draft is a crapshoot, so the more chances that you take, the more picks that you make, the higher chance you have of actually hitting on one of those picks and getting a quality player. So I think the Giants really should trade down this year um, as long as, you know, there's not – I'm probably keeping – where staying where I'm at, if you know Jalen Waddle, Michael Parsons, there's a couple guys who I might not be willing to trade down from. But if the Giants are trading down, I don't want them to go back too far potentially. So I think 15 is a perfect spot. I think it makes a lot of sense. 
And I think that this mock draft um, went really well, but I'd love to hear what everyone thinks of it. Let me know what you think down below in the comment section. Tell me what you would have done differently. Maybe you wouldn't have gone with the injured guys in the first two rounds, but let me know, and I'm really curious to, to hear it. Yeah, yeah, one last thing on Jalen Darden. I mean, think about Tyreek Hill. He's five foot ten, 185 pounds, and he looks small on the football field. You know, he looks like a like a really small guy. Jalen Darden's five foot seven and 170 pounds. Like he is, from an NFL perspective, you know, a very small person. Like he is, he is like uh, oh, what's his name? Um, with that cornerback we had a couple of years ago, Deontay, Deontay, what's his name? You know what I'm talking I about? Actually, he was like. He was no, so small. He was so small. Um, oh, man. All right. If you if you remember, look it up while I'm talking right now because I got to remember this right now. Dante Dion? Is that his Dante name? Dion. Dante Dion. Remember him? He was tiny, but he made some really nice plays. Um, he had a couple of interceptions in spring training. They never really gave him a shot because I, I just don't think they, he had, he really offered much against the run um, You know, because he was just so small. But at the end of the day, this is a pretty good draft class. I think Anthony uh, put together some injured players, but the upside is undeniable. You solve multiple positions on the interior line with a, with a standout like Landon Dickerson. You get yourself a premier edge rusher in Jalen Phillips. Get yourself a, a good wide receiver who has a lot of potential as a kick returner and a slot guy. Um, and you have yourself a big interior lineman on the defensive side with uh, Tyler Shelvin. So pretty good, pretty good players here. Let us know what you think in the comment section below. We'll have some clips throughout the video of these uh, prospects and so you can get an idea of what they have to offer as always. But make sure to turn on your notifications for Apple and Spotify and your everything else for YouTube, really. We have so much coming up. Uh, we have the draft next week and we'll be doing a, a video a live stream for the entire first round and the next day too for the for the other rounds we'll be doing live streams in the next couple of days leading up to the draft so we can go through a couple of different scenarios with you guys and you guys can give us your ideas we'll bring you on to talk and stuff so that should be fun but as always I hope you enjoyed the video we'll catch you guys on the next one